The tax system also provides support for affordable housing. I'd like to mention that very briefly in concluding. A key question that I think is worth further examination is whether the benefits that the tax code has for affordable housing are well targeted. In other words, do the dollars actually reach the people who most need help with affordable housing, or do the benefits instead go to other parties such as real estate developers? In general, a sound principle is for tax subsidies to target people rather than places. And this suggests a focus on demand-side tax subsidies for affordable housing, such as the Housing Choice Voucher, the so-called Section 8 program. In contrast, the low-income housing tax credit has the potential to boost construction of affordable housing units. I think it'd be useful for Congress and for the committee to, um, to mandate careful empirical analysis, data, not anecdotes, to assess whether this is the case. And the idea is for tax policy to ensure that taxpayer resources be used in the most effective way to support the vital goal of affordable housing. Thank you very much. Final point, and then I would love to have maybe your thoughts, to both of you, is Mr. Swagel in particular, you mentioned the low income housing tax credit. Mm -hmm. As a Republican, I would argue if you look at all the housing policy that the federal government does, and unfortunately Mr. Camp doesn't have jurisdiction over all of it, uh, we only have jurisdiction <laughs> over some of it, uh, whether it's at HUD, whether it's uh, Section 8 housing, very familiar with, with both uh, programs, or whether it's a low income housing tax credit, mm -hmm. as someone who tilts to the right from your testimony, why wouldn't we be encouraging public-private sector support? Maybe the amount's wrong, maybe the subsidy's wrong, but isn't it a good thing to get the public and private sector working together, which is exactly what the low-income housing tax credit does? It gets the best of both worlds. It has the federal government involved. It has the private sector involved. It has nonprofits involved. Mm -hmm. And in my community, I got to tell you, if you, if you and I went to tour housing for low-income people in my community, in central Ohio, and you looked at HUD property, and you looked at Section 8 property, and you looked at low-income housing tax credit property, there's no comparison in terms of what is the best managed, the best utilized, the, the best housing for low-income individuals. And I take issue with the fact that we don't have low-income housing. I can give you a property in my district on Livingston Avenue that has homeless veterans transitioning in their lives uh, in, in property. And they went literally from the streets into low-income housing tax credit property into the workforce. It's a fabulous, fabulous property. Well, so I would, I would say, as, as my testimony says, the goals of both the, the mortgage interest deduction and the low-income housing tax credit are laudable. And I fully support the goals. The question, as I've written in my testimony, is the targeting. And it's, it's an open question in the economics literature for the LIHTC how effective it is. So do the, do the benefits of this taxpayer support, to what extent do they result in new, new units? Help us that's improve it. Help us improve it. That's right. exactly it. So that's, that's what we want to do. Is, for getting money to low-income housing, I mean, there's a lot of different routes. I mean, the low-income housing credit in the tax code is one method, but it has to pass through a lot of middlemen on the way. So a lot of folks think grants would be better. And then a lot of, you know, the other thing you could do is give people vouchers for rental housing uh, just directly from the government. Or, as I said, you could do it through a refundable tax credit. The problem is people who don't file taxes then would have to file. So a lot of people do if they're, if they're working because of the earned income credit. But, you know, there's all these, for this particular objective, there's a lot of different ways to get there. And I would say, maybe Eric can tell me what he thinks, the consensus is that usually these things are better done through spending rather than routing them through the tax system. I want to dive into something a little bit more on the low income tax credit because um, this is an area where I've spent some time with some folks in Minnesota. I've seen the homes that the low income, ta uh, income tax credit has actually produced uh, through rehabilitation and low income ta individuals. And I do hear from the providers all the time that this is a credit that is a very effective way of producing affordable housing and providing homes for those who need it. And so knowing that that's the case, I mean, and part of the problem in the past has been a wonder, is the tax provision, is this tax provision going to get extended? Is it going to be extended once again? So there's no certainty, there's no predictability for building the housing. And so that's one of the goals of tax reform is to remove that, make sure we have some predictability and certainty. But just to follow up, what would happen if that tax credit just went away? Would making that tax credit permanent 
improve results or whatever takes its place improve results? And is there a way we can actually improve that credit for better results? Uh, you know, again, it's been a public-private partnership, but Mr. Swagel, you've talked a little bit about that in your testimony, and I know this is a long section of the tax code, but can you just maybe elaborate a little bit more? Sure. Sure. I, I, I think the permanence would be really important that uh, to get at this uncertainty. The other thing that uh, would help is that the value of the tax credit uh, varies with the economic cycle and the demand for it. And so there's a sense in which it, it's just not clear that the tax code is the best way to, to do this. If we want more supply of affordable housing units, which, which I think as a nation we do, it's probably better done as spending and not to run it through the tax code. Um, so that, that's the other thing that might be considered. And, and again, it's not an argument to say do less of it. It's, it's really do it, uh, do it better. But I think there is a, you know, some of my testimony questions its effectiveness. And it's really it's that. It's, it's, is it effective? And what's the best way to, to, to make it effective? Because um, we want to do both supply and demand, not supply or demand. You know, the vouchers will help on the demand side, and, and I think the, the you know, affordable housing uh, tax credit or a better way of doing it can help on the supply side. Honestly, I've been a little skeptical over, you know, and certainly looked at low-income housing tax credit over time, and I certainly understand why, you know, users of a program think it's a great program, but to me the academic evidence suggests, A, there's a tremendous amount of crowd out, and that maybe about half of the units would have gotten built otherwise. B, there's evidence to suggest that most of the subsidy ends up with developers, syndicators, lawyers, and I have nothing against developers, syndicators, lawyers, all good people, but they're not necessarily who I think we should prioritize subsidizing. Uh, and so I'm skeptical of it as a, as a delivery vehicle. I mean, my tendency tends to mean I'm, I'm, I worry, you know, I know that public-private always sounds like a good thing, but, you know, I remember for years telling what a great public-private partnership Fannie Mae was for the government, and that didn't turn out so well. So I do think we need to rethink some of what that means. Uh, I think uh, Phil alluded to this earlier, which is I think we should directly subsidize the people we want to directly subsidize. If we care about low-income households, let's subsidize low-income households. Uh, I'm very skeptical of doing it roundabout ways through, uh, through intermediaries. You know, if the problem is somebody's poor, let's make them not poor. And that seems like a pretty straightforward way of doing it to me. One other thought to, to add to what you heard from the constituents in Minnesota is that um, on the upkeep, and that, that is the case, mm -hmm. that the, right. the tax credit subsidized units do have better upkeep, and that's because eventually those units go back to a fully private model. And sometimes that's the challenge is how do we get that? How do we make sure that, you know, low-income units are not just Section 8, they're not just for low-income people, but there's a, the diversity and that incentive for better upkeep. I you want to add before we wrap it that you know the, the the geographic evidence suggests to me that the tax credits properties do get built in areas that are already highly high concentrations of race and poverty. So I tend to be more preferential to vouchers because I think we want to be able to get people to get into good communities rather than continuing to build properties and unit than neighborhoods that already have problems and high concentrations of poverty to begin with. NHB strongly supports the low income housing tax credit. Created in the 1986 reform effort, it is the most effective tool for the creation of affordable rental housing. Utilizing a public-private partnership to attract investment, the tax credit has created over 2 million affordable rental units. The need for such housing remains significant, and we strongly urge the committee to protect this program. Fifth, we must protect and make permanent the low-income housing tax credit since Harvard is currently estimating that we have a shortage of at least three million of affordable units. The housing credit is a bipartisan product of tax reform and a permanent feature of the tax code. Today, the housing credit is generally recognized as the most successful housing production and preservation program. The housing credit is actually two programs. First, it is a capped tax credit program where states receive an annual amount of tax credits based on their population. And second, it is a bond credit program which combines fewer tax credits with tax-exempt multifamily bonds. One of the essential elements of the housing credit program is the role that state housing finance agencies play in administering the program. States annually prepare and publish qualified allocation plans that lay out state housing needs and priorities after soliciting public input through a transparent and open process. Our nation is experiencing a crisis in affordable housing. This is not a new crisis, but it has grown worse in recent years. One quarter of all renters pay half of or more of their income in rent. Nearly two-thirds of extremely low 
household renters pay at least half of their income in rent. And the reason low-income households face such high rent burdens is the shortage of affordable housing. On average, state housing finance agencies re receive applications annually for more than twice as much housing credit as they have available. Federal priorities have a major impact on how states run their housing credit program. And while the statute permits targeting to households with incomes up to 60% of area median income, according to a recent study by the Furman Center at New York University, the program in fact reaches much further down the income scale where the need is greatest. Since the housing credit program was established in 1986, it has made possible the development of more than 2.5 million rental homes. Each year, about 100,000 new rental homes are developed or preserved under the program. This program also accounts for 95,000 jobs annually. This produces almost $8 billion of local income through wages for workers and profits for small businesses, and about $1 billion in taxes and other revenues for local governments. The housing credit serves the full spectrum of housing need, including housing for families, seniors, people with special needs, veterans, and the homeless in all geographic areas. Many local governments have used the housing credit over the years to spark neighborhood revitalization and help restore blighted areas. There are several key elements of the program that have led to a success. First, state housing finance agencies administer the program. This ensures that properties are developed according to local housing needs. Second, the private sector provides market discipline. And third, the housing credit program is well designed within the Internal Revenue Code. Tax credits are not earned until the development is completed, it's in operation, and housing qualified residents. This means that real estate construction and other risks are borne by the private sector, not the federal government. This threat of recapture imposes a powerful discipline on the program that ensures the properties are properly underwritten at the outset and dil diligently managed throughout the compliance period. Housing would not be built or preserved but for the capital contributed because of the housing credit. It is a safety net program that requires continued federal support. This committee did great work in 1986 when it created the housing credit. You designed a critically important program to maximize its efficiency, ensure investment occurs where it's needed the most, and harness private sector business discipline to achieve an important public policy objective. I, uh, I wondered, uh, Mr. Moss, if you just wanted to comment on the previous panel. Uh, there was a lot of testimony about uh, the incentives on the low-income housing tax credit and maybe it should go more to the individual as opposed to the way it's structured now. I don't know if you had a chance to think about that and if you had any comment on that. Well, you may want to hit your microphone. <laughs> If, if you look at most of the uh, uh, tax credit properties right now um, in terms of achieving deeper targeting, um, they do. Um, if you look at the Furman Center study uh, and the, the type of targeting that is going on across the country, most tax credit properties are not just set at 60 percent of area median income. They serve levels at 40, at 30 percent of median income. So there's some targeting going on there that would not be achievable under any other program. Um, and especially with the, the, the private capital coming in to leverage uh, these properties, uh, it's not achievable under any other type of spending program. Um, in terms of the supply of low-income housing, is it sh in a shortage all over the country or are there regions where that that's less the case? Uh, the, the, the universe of affordable housing, when you start to talk about all the population types, is, is dramatic. As I mentioned in my testimony, we are now doing a lot of housing for veterans, returning veterans. Uh, there is a shortage. There's a great shortage of affordable housing in, in the United States in all areas. The nice and the great part about the credit is it's flexible and it can serve to provide housing for a lot of different housing types. I guess I didn't ask that the right way. Is, are there areas of the country where the need is greater than others? Um, certainly higher population areas 
uh, where there's uh, more employment, uh, there's probably more of a need, but also you have to remember that the bond program serves a useful tool in those areas as well, not just the, the capped credit. Mm -hmm. And um, you're going to see that there's, uh, if you look at the credits across the country uh, with the per capita uh, allocation formula, there's very little that spills over into the national pool that's unused, if, okay. if any at all. Mr. Ro Mr. Moss, um, see, I come from Seattle, where we spent a lot of effort politically passing initiatives for low-income housing, and we have had passed levies on a continue, almost a continuing basis over the last few years to build housing. And so we have a lot of low-income housing that is managed by a variety of uh, public agencies in some instances and sometimes by uh, private uh, nonprofits that are running them. And we've got Section 8 going on in our state like everybody else does. Tell me from your point of view the place where we ought to put our emphasis on low-income housing. Where, where should the money go if you're going to be the most effective? Is it in government building housing, as we did before Ronald Reagan, or is it in the low-income tax credit stuff in the 86 and thereafter, or is it in Section 8? Uh, I, because I see us coming to a point where we're having more and more old people in this society who are going to be looking for housing as they are forced out by taxes and other things. I'm trying to figure out for, for the community, where is the most effective way, or what's the most effective way to, to put the housing up? Well, first of all, starting in 1986, when the tax credit uh, was put in place, the low-income housing tax credit, it started to replace all the failed federal programs that had gone on prior to that time. Uh, programs that did not have the private sector involved, that did not have uh, the private sector with uh, risk in the game. And today, the low-income housing tax credit is the highest performing real estate class in the United States of any real estate class because of the private sector involvement, because of the state agencies doing the oversight and the underwriting and assessing housing need, and due to uh, the nature of uh, the type of housing that's being built, which is very high quality housing. The, the programs in the, from the past, the federal programs, um, are now being preserved using the low income housing tax credit. They're being regenerated by bringing in the private sector. You mean taking the old federally built ones and turning it into a uh, low income tax? Y yes. Okay. Yes, sir bringing in the investors, uh, renewing the project, making sure that the units are, are rehabbed in a sustainable fashion so they'll, they'll, they will last uh, another uh, 40 years. Um, it's a very important role that the credit plays is that it, it can play every position on the team. It can really, it can fix rehab, housing that needs rehab, federal housing, it can do new construction, it can build uh, uh, housing for those individuals that have disabilities. It can build veterans housing. Um, it's a very, very flexible program, and I hope that answers your question. There's one in Seattle named the McDermott Place, which has 54 homeless veterans living in it. So I know, yeah. I know about how it's done. But you didn't say anything about Section 8. Where, where does Section 8 fit in all of this? Well, Section 8 is not an operating new construct, uh, production program at this point. I know time. it doesn't produce, yeah. but, it's but it's a way of saying you haven't got a house, so here's a voucher, go find some place in the private sector that will take it. Is that a more effective way than building the, the building and, and operating it as a low-income housing? Well, most no, it, I don't believe it is. I believe that having the private sector involved uh, private the private sector is involved in the Section 8, aren't they? They can be where the project receives either project-based funding or vouchers to support extremely low incomes, which support the debt service for the property. But those federal programs also had uh, subsidies for debt. When the properties are redone and rehabbed under the tax credit program, it's at conventional 
debt rates, and the vouchers and the subsidy provide uh, subsidy to the renter, not to the property. And the same on low-income housing, because while the testimony has been basically positive, I'm afraid that there may be suggestions that we would significantly change that. And I'm not in favor of the status quo, but I think going after these important policies, it's not a loophole, the low-income housing tax credit. It's a policy adopted by this country on a bipartisan basis, and I think we better be careful before we significantly tamper with it. Just a quick comment based on, again, previous experience in, in terms of uh, dealing with Section 8s. It's the saturation point on Section 8s that begin to change neighborhoods. It's the concentration of, of Section 8s. And I, I think that that's one of the challenges because, as I pointed out to the earlier panel, there are few issues that are more complex than urban economics than housing. And the experiments we had in the 50s and the 60s where many of our veterans coming back, it worked quite well. And then as the housing grew much older and there was less money to keep it up to date, uh, in old cities, landlords began to walk away from properties. And one of the phenomena that came in those years was abandonment. And those of us who had to deal with that uh, abandonment issue, it was very significant because it was great difficulty in tracking the landlord. And I think having the private sector involved and helping to discipline uh, those aspects of the marketplace is, is uh, terribly important. Uh, Mr. Moss, I was surprised that you mentioned uh, the shortage of affordable housing. And I, I, it's always important, I think, to use the term affordable housing. And because the, the connotation of low-income housing, again, is that you're going back to high-rise developments and that you're going back to uh, a concentration of Section 8s, but you've mentioned that there's a shorter shortage of affordable housing in your testimony. W would you speak to that issue? <coughs> yeah. The uh, Harvard study that was most recently published, uh, uh, the report showed that only four eligible low-income households out of ten were finding an apartment that achieved affordability for them. Four out of ten. So there's six households out of ten that cannot find uh, an apartment where their rent, rental uh, costs are 30 percent of their uh, monthly income or less. They're paying 50 percent, 60 percent of their monthly income in rent. And so the rent burden is, is tremendous in this country. The Harvard report demonstrates that, um, sir and also the recent Bipartisan Policy Housing Center report. Uh, one, one of the confusing Please. things I Would you turn on the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, on affordability, uh, we, we need to define it. So some people say affordability with 80 percent of the median income. And if you do 80 percent of the median income, like the apartment industry, uh, 90 percent of the people in housing are affordable. The very the low income, where you can only afford to pay 50 or 60 percent or 40 percent of the median income, is where the real problem is. So it's the low income which needs to be subsidized and needs to have the credits and needs to have the Section 8s. If those, if that gap that's currently there is going to be, you know, right. we're going to close that gap. But I also think it's fair to say that management's a key issue. Yes on how those units are managed? Yes. Because you get some first-class management teams, nobody would even know it was affordable housing or, right. or subsidized housing. And then if you get a bad management team that simply accepts the subsidy and walks away from the property, when things start to go south for them on their other investments, and that's frequently what happens, they stop any sort of upkeep to the property. And we, I think we need to be mindful of that. But how would you strengthen the low-income credit? Because I've been a supporter of new markets, low-income housing credit, and I think it works. How would you propose that the panel is strengthening the, the option? Well, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, your, your, your uh, bill with uh, Mr. Tiberi that uh, fixes the 9 percent rate. I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fixes the 9 percent rate, fixes the 4 percent I don't see rate. a prompt here, do I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, without that, the, the credit rate on the tax credit falls, and it results in 18 percent less equity in the deal. And so fixing that rate ensures that a sufficient amount of equity is available, because this is a production program. And we heard in the earlier panel Economists like vouchers, in, in theory, but vouchers don't help build the property. They help 
allocate the, the demand after the fact. But the, this, this program is really useful in the sense that it provides safe, affordable housing on the production side. Thank you very much. I appreciate the special emphasis that uh, several of you made in terms of the low income tax credit. Uh, I think it's important to drive that home when there's so much uh, flux.